I am, uh, I'm actually going to be a lot more um, uh, scripted in my uh, presentation because I've done this a couple times and I never get to where I need to go. <laughs> so I, I don't want to rush because what I'm going to do is actually lay out a, a proposal to kind of resolve the problem of pluralism that Marx just identified. Uh, so it's, it's a, um, a positive approach here rather than a critique. And uh, uh, um, so I'm just going to go ahead and I'll begin by kind of motivating what I, what I refer to as the liberal dilemma. And then I'll go on to uh, kind of lay out how I propose to resolve the problem. Okay, so Western liberal democracies have to maintain neutrality among competing comprehensive worldviews, both religious and secular, while justifying and adjudicating under the law. This, require, this requirement of neutrality is dictated by uh, what is sometimes referred to as the liberal principle of reciprocity. And that principle uh, is as follows, that the exercise of political coercion is justifiable only when it is based on reasons all citizens can be expected to accept. But the very possibility of liberal neutrality has come under attack, uh, it, it increasingly come under attack in a pluralistic post-secular world. 21st century pluralism challenges even the most basic Enlightenment principles, principles once thought to be universal and beyond rational critique. If the secular philosophical justifications for even the most basic Enlightenment principles, such as that persons are worthy of respect as free and equal, have lost their claim to universality, they've also lost any claim to neutrality. This poses a dilemma for liberalism. Historically, the principal justification for cordoning off religious reasons from the official justification of law was that as matters of faith, religious reasons are inherently irreconcilable, irreconcilable and incommensurable and therefore cannot satisfy the liberal principle of reciprocity. But pluralistic democracies, secular foundational or comprehensive justifications have become matters of faith as well. The Enlightenment justification for privileging these secular reasons over religious reasons in justifying the law and its enforcement therefore no longer exists. They're all, both the secular and the religious reasons are now on equal footing. Thus, consistency demands that the liberal take one, or uh, is faced with this dilemma and, and has to grasp one or the, the two following horns. First, open up official justification to religious and secular compre comprehensive doctrines completely. And I refer to this as the open competition model, so taking all comers. And, or, or alternatively, find a way to exclude both. Find a way to exclude both secular comprehensive worldviews and religious comprehensive worldviews from the public political forum. Now what I'm going to, to offer uh, here is, is uh, a way of grasping the second horn. I want to suggest that pluralistic liberal democracies should adopt the foundation neutral model. I have a number of reasons for why I think the open competition model is, uh, is the wrong path and um, is not viable for liberal democracies. I can't get into them here for lack of time, but uh, just real quickly, um, uh, I, I believe adopting this open competition model risks fomenting political instability, uh, risks stifling public political discourse, and is going to ultimately, at the end of the day, end up violating the liberal principle of reciprocity to the extent that one group ultimately gains dominion over the others, uh, their terms or their comprehensive uh, voca doctor doctrinal vocabulary will end up dictating the terms of, of the public debate, and this will violate the liberal principle of reciprocity. So that's why, uh, enough said about the open competition model. Um, the, as for the foundation neutral model, though, uh, there are some obvious problems just right off the bat. Uh, first, the idea as foundation neutral, it's required to actually stay on the surface religiously and philosophically. It has to avoid foundational commitments in articulating and justifying and uh, legitimating the law. But how can uh, the law be justified without an appeal to comprehensive foundational principles? Secondly, moreover, even if we can stay on the surface, how can we address complex questions? In other words, even if, such sound, uh, even if some such foundation neutral justification were possible, 
it seems it would be too thin to resolve complex issues affecting matters of ultimate concern, such as abortion, capital punishment, etc. cetera. Um, so there's a concern that A, we're not gonna be able to resolve the dispute if we have to say, stay on the surface and can't appeal to foundational commitments. And then even if we could find a way to actually engage in uh, discourse, limiting ourselves to just foundational cultural <coughs> premises, the concern is we could never deal with nuanced topics or problems in any so as to actually uh, settle disputes. <clears throat> so I have to, I have to, uh, in offering a foundation neutral solution, I've got to be able to address each of these concerns. Uh, and the approach that I take, the path forward, is that I focus on a model for resolving political dispute and justifying and legitimating the law that is based on grounded in practice as opposed to principle. So, um, <clears throat> what, so I'm going to step back now and just kind of situate uh, this this alternative approach, this alternative model for discourse that I'm that's going to kind of provide the basis for the for the the uh, foundation neutral model that I'm going to propose. And that is, I, I think that whereas discourse used to be understood as a matter of knowing that, I think it, ought to, it should better be understood as, uh, in more prag uh, pragmatist terms, as a matter of knowing how. So let me explain what I mean here. The assumption that foundational commitments are required to ground discourse can be traced uh, to the Enlightenment, to Enlightenment rationalism. Kant, for example, held that all justification is rule gov governed. In other words, governed by norms that can be made propositionally explicit all the way down to, rationally, uh, to rational, rationally basic principles. In other words, justification is always a matter of knowing that. On this model, no argument is complete unless the pro proponent stands ready to make its ultimate foundational support explicit. But Wittgenstein uh, actually exposed a serious flaw in this approach, approach to rationality. It has a problem of regress. For Kant, an inference is only correct if licensed by a rule, but the application of the rule to the inference can be correct or incorrect, and it must therefore be licensed by another rule, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we have a, a, a regress is initiated, and it's only halted by finding a way of licensing the application of the rule that does not itself need to be made propositionally explicit, that is not, in other words, not itself a rule. Um, and for Wittgenstein, the answer is found in practice, right? So it must ultimately reduce to a matter of knowing how. This is where we kind of move into what, uh, and actually I, I forgot to give the title of my piece, which is uh, Law Beyond God and Kant, A Pragmatist Path to Liberal Neutrality in uh, Pluralistic Democracies. And so now what I'm gonna shift to is show how pragmatism opens the way, or as Mark, to use Mark's phrase, it clears a space here for us to then introduce a foundation neutral model. Um, for the pragmatist, the relevant practice against which beliefs are going to be tested is the social linguistic practice or game of giving and asking for reasons. The basic move in this game is that of an assertion. An assertion is an expression of commitment that a move in this game is entitled. It is also it also is an expression that you are that others are licensed in making the same move on the authority of this uh, entitlement. So Robert Brandon, who's a philosopher of Pittsburgh, explains that keeping track of these commitments undertaken by oneself and others is a matter of keeping dionic score, and being rational is just a matter of quote mastering and practice the evolution of this score. But isn't this pragmatist account also subject, or doesn't it also risk the problem of, uh, uh, or create its own regress problem? Let me explain. Um, so entitlement, if it's the case that entitlement is demonstrated by justification, um, in other words, inherited from another of one's own commitments, or by deferral to authority, in other words, inherited from another's commitment, um, if that's what the picture of entitlement that this game of giving and asking for reasons lays out, um, the, the obvious next question is, is it doesn't either source of entitlement, then uh, since either source of entitlement can itself be challenged, don't you create a new regress problem, right? Then you're challenged and then you're offered required to, to, uh, to provide another uh, source of entitlement on, at, on, 
ad infinitum. But unlike, and, and this is the, the this is what kind of um, the the crux of the of the pragmatist method, right? Unlike Kant's model, where entitlement is not attributed until demonstrated, where entitlement is grounded in social linguistic practice, we can see that within the practice, many claims are treated as innocent until proven guilty. So. Uh, such assertions are going to enjoy a default status in the game of getting at, giving and asking for re reasons, and they're going to be treated as entitled until they are credibly challenged. So what happens here is that, that when we look at, it, at these entitlement as grounded in practice, there can be, with respect to certain um, assertions, right, they enjoy a default status, which shifts the burden to anyone challenging. And so in that situation, what I, these are what I call free moves, these default positions are free moves in public political discourse, there are free moves in the game of giving and asking for reason, they don't need to be defended. And so if someone chooses to challenge one of these free moves, the burden is on them to express entitlement. Um, and free moves, as we'll see here, are uh, going to play a crucial role in this, in this positive model that I'm going to offer. So let's begin and let me show you what, what I kind of have in mind, how, we, how we're going to solve the problem or the liberal dilemma. So we begin, uh, I suggest, by constructing what I call a constitutional conception of justice. And the first step uh, in constructing such a conception is to kind of take the third person standpoint with respect to your public political culture. So you kind of look at your public political culture from the perspective of a cultural anthropologist. And we do this by observing uh, these practices from the third person perspective and trying to tease out, looking at what, uh, what people get away with without challenge in public political discourse. So for example, uh, the, cl the claim, we can all agree race is not a relevant criterion for pri privileging one individual class or uh, one individual or class over another is a statement that any uh, politician could get a, could begin his or her uh, speech at a rally with without losing his audience, right? The Republican, Democrat, Peace Party, or uh, or Green Party, right? You could begin with that statement, and your audience is still going to be cheering you, right? And then from that, we might make draw. Uh, there might be controversial inferences that you could draw from that. Uh, premise, but the premise itself is in our culture a free move. It enjoys default status. To the extent you want to challenge that claim, the burden will be on you to demonstrate entitlement. Right? So, <clears throat> in building off of this opening statement, again, you could go on to uh, generate controversial conclusions. Right? But so long as the narrative that, uh, that the politician weaves flows reasonably from the free moves and does not undermine its neutrality by enlisting controversial foundational commitments, the audience should remain engaged even if not in agreement. Once a critical mass of these types of free moves are identified, uh, we move to the second step. And the second step will be to actually build a foundation neutral con or constitutional conception of justice. So we begin with this collection of free moves that we've teased out of our public political culture, and uh, we build from it a uh, certain uh, principles of justice, right? Um, and they could be tailored to a specific question, or they could be more general. But the idea, it, it, and you could do this in any number of ways. You could do it as, for example, John Rawls does by saying, from these uh, free moves, we will construct a, a moral conception of a person, and then from that moral conception of a person, uh, work out some principles that, uh, that would be consistent with that exception, conception and so on. But I don't think it's limited to that approach. I think there are a number of different ways of doing this. Um, and the point here is that it is expected that because different inferences can be drawn from the same uh, free moves, uh, any number of different constitutional conceptions could be constructed from the same vocabulary of free moves. Um, but up to this point, the exercise, say an individual constructs a constitutional conception, so far the exercise has still, it still remains descriptive, right? We have not, we've, we've covered the is, we have not gotten to the ought. Um, for this, we need the third and final step, and that is uh, that of justification. Now, justification, and therefore normativity, has to always be ad hominem. The constitutional conception of justice is not normative for an individual citizen unless they're committed to it. 
So they must now be able to avow it from within the wider context of their comprehensive worldview. And the requirement of a constitutional conception of, a, of justice uh, uh, be, a, be avowed from within a comprehensive worldview may affect the outcome in one of two ways. First, the citizen may shape her con comprehensive worldview toward the constitutional conception, or uh, going in the other direction, the constitutional conception uh, or comprehensive worldview will require the avowal of a different constitutional conception. And this is very much along the lines of those of you familiar with Rawls's reflective equilibrium. And, and I'm suggesting nothing different um, from that here. Now, <clears throat> at the point at which an individual citizen has a re reached reflect reflective equ equilibrium with respect to a given constitutional conception of justice, uh, we, that constitutional conception is then avowed by them and normative for that citizen. And now I want to go, so we've constructed the constitutional conception, now we want to go ahead and distinguish between two different types. One is the individual ideal constitutional conception, what we just worked out um, in, in, uh, uh, for an individual citizen. And then the sec second is the actual constitutional conception, and that is for a given society. That's the current state of the society's constitutional law where all citizens adopt the foundation neutral model. So all citizens recognize they're working under this model. Uh, the constitutional, the state of the constitutional law um, at, at any given moment in time under this model would be the actual conception. So even though the actual conception will be non-ideal for many or most citizens, and they may uh, do all they can to try to change that actual conception, it's nevertheless going to be normative for them. Why? It's, this is because um, it is the result of ongoing free and fair competition among individual ideal constitutional conceptions, which were each, in turn, uh, constructed from free moves, and therefore in the spirit of cooperation and mutual respect. So you have the con individuals constructing their individual ideal conceptions, doing so uh, in the spirit of, of cooperation and mutual respect by arguing only from free moves or constructing only from free moves, and then they compete in public political discourse to create the actual conception, but then the actual conception then in turn is normative for them because they recognize it, how it was constructed in this way. Now, uh, I just want to close real quickly by uh, you, you've heard me refer to Rawls quite a bit in this discussion, and there's a lot of Rawls in what I'm doing, but I want to I identify uh, some crucial distinctions between what I'm suggesting here and that of uh, and Rawls. First, a common criticism of Rawls is that there is a little chance of a pluralistic society reaching an overlapping consensus on a single political conception of justice as, uh, as, there, as there is of their agreeing on a single comprehensive worldview, right? Um, and this is, I think, a telling criticism of Rawls to the extent he is actually committed to that uh, idea. But my account accepts this and nevertheless explains normativity where there is no such consensus. I'm, normativity is achieved under this, the model that I'm offering without such an overlapping consensus on a single set of, of shared principles. Um, my account also expects that individual ideal constitutional conceptions and a society's actual constitutional conception will be constantly evolving. There's no goal um, uh, of, say, for example, as Rawls uh, often refer, Rawls often refers to a well-ordered society, and I know this is a sticking point remark with Rawls, um, but to the extent what Rawls means by a well-ordered society is that you have an overlapping consensus, or that the goal is an overlapping consensus on a single set of shared principles that everyone completely uh, accepts. That's not what I'm suggesting we strive for. I don't think it's possible. I think that what the, the uh, pragmatist model that I've suggested is it's a process. It's an, it's an ongoing evolution. It will never end. Uh, it will constantly be evolving as individuals ideal conceptions will constantly be evolving. So I'm just going to close real quickly um, uh, with a quote that I love from William James that I think perfectly captures what I'm trying to accomplish in this model. Uh, in quoting uh, the Italian pragmatist Giovanni Papini, James writes, pragmatism lies in the midst of our theories, like a corridor in a hotel. 
innumerable chamber, chambers open out of it, in one you may find a man writing an aesthetic volume, in the next someone on his knees praying for faith and strength, in a third a chemist investigating a body's properties, in a fourth a system of idealistic metaphysics is being excogitated, in a fifth the impossibility of metaphysics is being shown. But they all own the corridor, and all must pass through it if they want a practicable way of getting into or out of their respective rooms. If the foundation neutral model um, is to offer a solution to the dilemma of pluralism in the post-enlightenment liberal state, it has to provide a space for public political discourse that resembles this corridor, and the model I've offered here, I think, does that. <laughs>